Good morning and welcome to the latest episode of Tech Salescraft with me, James Hounslow. And today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Nick Shaw, uh, who is the CRO over at Brightpole. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, James. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. No problem. Well, I've been trying to get you on for a, uh, a little while as a, a leader who's done some, some great stuff. I, I know we're going to dig quite a lot into Brightpole because the, the transition from when you arrived to where it is now is quite a great story. Mm-hmm. But before we dive into that, do you want to just give up the audience a, an idea of who you are and, and what you did prior to Brightpole? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a sales leader who has um, a few decades worth of experience um, in sales and general leadership. I was at um, a well-known security company um, for roughly 10 years doing various leadership roles throughout Europe, um, Middle East and Africa, and ran my final job there was running their consumer business throughout Europe, Middle East and Africa, um, which was a pretty exciting role for me. I really enjoyed that. Um, started, as most people did, as a, as a kind of it wasn't called a BDR then, but as a, as a, as an outbound tele salesperson, and obviously moved from there to, to 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 internal sales and then into sales leadership over time, which I think is a fairly well trodden path for most people, and certainly is a good path to tread because it helps you understand the challenges of the different roles within a sales organisation. And obviously, in my current role, I've run sales, marketing, professional services, support, and customer success. So I have a fairly um, varied role at Bright Pearl, which I've been with for just over two and a half years. Bright Pearl and, and where you were before, two mm-hmm. very different uh, types of organizations in very different stages uh, yeah. of, their, of their lives. What made you decide that? Right, Pearl was the the right opportunity to move because I imagine there was a lot of opportunity a to stay where you were um, and and continue growing in, in what you did in in what is quite a fantastic business, um, but I'm sure there was a lot of companies within security that would want you and other businesses. So what was it about Bright Pearl, um, and and what stage of the business was it actually at when you walked through the door? So so when I worked through the door, the business had just um, clicked through the 10 million ARR yeah. um, revenue gate. So, so it, it's, you know, way past kind of seed round or series A and was, was more into the kind of B slash B C rounds as such. Um, I think there was probably a couple of things that, that, that attracted me to Bright Pearl. One is I'd be... I liked some of the investors, you know, I knew some of the investors had been watching what they were doing and liked some of the investors and been having discussions with the investors, which I think is an important thing. Yeah. I'd worked with the CEO before, which is a, a really important, important thing for me anyway, to have the right people in the leadership roles to make sure you can be successful. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't matter how great the company is, if you've got the wrong people in the wrong roles, then you may not be successful. Yeah. I liked um, the retail tech area. Um, I saw it as a growing area, an evolving area. And, you know, that's run true as, as to how we've done over the past year and a half. But it was, a, it was an interesting growing area that I really wanted to get into. Yes, it was completely different from security. But I did want to do something different from security. So I didn't want to go into another security company in this kind of ticked many boxes. Was it the perfect role at the time? No, but no role ever is perfect. You've just got to look at different things and go, this seems to be the right one and take the leap as such. Interesting point there, because I actually put a uh, poll out on LinkedIn this morning Mm -hmm. about what people look for first when they're thinking about a job right now. And two bits that you came up there which I just want to dive into a little bit was the investor and the CEO Mm -hmm. you didn't talk about products that came obviously as a product that you're interested in Mm -hmm. but what was important was the investors which is critical at the stage that you're coming in in a leadership um, and the CEO why did you mention those ahead of product that you're selling because I think if you're you know I, I look at it that you've got to assume the product's going to be fairly reasonable yeah. You know, you've got to assume, you know, you're not going to have the best product in the world and you're not going to have the worst product in the world. And assuming the product's fairly reasonable, then if you have faith in the ability of your teams that, that you're growing or, and yourself, then you can generally sell a product. And yeah. especially if they've got to 10 million ARR, you assume that the product's fairly reasonable. Yeah. 
and, and, and you're assuming also that, that it's not dying, you know, because obviously you could be in a decline, you know, and, and I assume. But the key is, if you've got the right investors who will invest money, give you as an individual at a, at a C level and the CEO the time, then you will be successful. Yeah. If you have the wrong investors who won't give you time, then you won't be successful. And therefore the product and everything doesn't really matter because you won't be given the time. And that's why to me, those things are very important. And I, I also want to enjoy who I work with. And therefore what I don't want is a CEO who I feel is difficult to work with and stuff like that. That's why it was very important for me to get on with the CEO, know the CEO. And having worked with him before, I was very comfortable with that. Yeah. Do, do you think that should be the same if you're an account executive, that you should be looking at the leadership first before the product? I think at an account executive level, you should be thinking, what do I want to do next? Yeah. And therefore, what do I want to learn? And if yeah. you want to learn, you know, because a lot of account executives can go and take jobs that pay very well and they can yeah. and they can just get paid well and that's great. And the leadership doesn't matter so much. And as long as they've got a great product, they can be paid well and stuff like that. I suppose it depends where you are in your journey as an, as an account executive. Yeah. Um, so if I was very new in, as an account executive, I may choose money over product, over le the learning journey. The ideal is to have a product that sells well, to be paid well and have yeah. great leadership. Yeah. Th th those kind of things don't always happen. And you normally have a couple out of those. It's like almost like a triangle. It is. It's, it's an interesting one because there's, there's obviously lots going on out there at the moment. But mm -hmm. if, I, if I looked at the biggest reason why anybody leaves an organisation, it will normally be to do with leadership in some right. way, shape or form. But it so often gets overlooked when someone goes in where they see something big and shiny and they do look at money, you know, as a big uh, pull up. But that soon only papers over the crack for so long if it's not right. Or in many cases, it, it, what you need to do to get to that money is much harder to, to, to necessarily you, achieve. I, I think you make a really good point there, James. And, and the, what happens is they get these magical OTEs. Yeah that are so unrealistic, that yeah. are not, you know, and the question I, I'd ask if I was an AE is, how many people made plan last year? Yeah. How many people, if they're, if they're, depending on the size of the organization, did you have a president's club? How many people yeah. made president's club or achievers club, whatever? You've got to have a reasonable amount of people making plan. Otherwise, you know, you're setting, you know, you could set yourself up for failure. You yeah. know, you're not, you know, that magical OTE, you're not going to get to. Yeah. Um, how many, how many, you know, the, the, the Americans, you know, how many rookies made plan? Yeah. Because that's true. Because because people who've been there four years who are making plan is very different to how many first years made plan. Because I think yeah. that's a really, really important thing. And, and you make a great point. People look at the salaries and they look at the OTE and they forget about sometimes the product. Yeah. And therefore the product maybe isn't that great, or they forget about um, the leadership. It, uh, and it's, it's such a critical part, as I say, when people exit companies that it, it should be looked at more within. So, so going back to, to Brightpole, you arrived at around uh, 10 million ARR. You joined these guys because of the leadership that was in place and you mm -hmm. shared in the vision and journey of what these guys were going on. So what was your role from, uh, from day one for that, that first part of the, uh, the journey? So, so I, I always look at it that, that your role is to help grow employees, grow mm -hmm. revenue, help get rid of problems. And what I mean by problems is barriers to being able to, whether it's being able to market the product better, being able to, so, so you know, one of the barriers were we were on an old website. Yeah. So the barrier, you know, one of the marketeers came to me and said, you know, this is an old website. Our, our traffic's low because of this. So, so the barrier I helped her with was getting getting us off that website. So going to the board, presenting to the board as to why we should move off, and getting getting us on on the new website, and that and that made a material difference. That's what I believe my role was, mm -hmm. is, is to help, and then also to analyze and look. You know, is to say what should we be doing in six months, twelve months, yeah. 
where can we give better customer service? Mm-hmm. Are we getting the right amount? Are we getting a fair amount for, for what we're charging? You know, and looking at different things like that to be able to deliver what the board wants. Mm-hmm. To deliver where that board was, was there hiring involved or was it upskilling people that were already there? So, so I think it's a multitude in any kind of scale up. It's both of those. Yeah. Yes, yes, you're trying to upskill what, what the employees and the great employees you've got. You're also hiring new employees as you expand because as the revenue grows, you need more salespeople, more marketeers, yeah. more customer success. All, all, all of those people, but also making sure, you know, this is a key thing for us in Bright Pearl is however many people you can take on the journey as possible. And what I mean by that is if you can hire them um, in their first job and then they can be promoted and then they can be promoted again, that's a great thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really breeds, you know, excitement within the company. If people can see people being hired and being promoted, whether it's a BDR moving to an account manager, a BDR moving to to to, to a partner manager, or or a partner manager being becoming the head of partnerships, it doesn't really matter. It, it's all positive, and that's what we've tried to do. And you've actually been quite successful at it. And do you put that down to a little bit of luck? or a strategic plan because when you look at other companies that have gone on a similar journey to bright pearl they've mm-hmm. actually hired much more aggressively to, mm-hmm. to to bring people in and it's more of a let's get some bodies in and see how it shakes out which is you know a, a route that happens but you seem to have increased revenue through using the people that you have and you've got a lot higher rate of people hanging around for longer and progressing through but not just progressing through but actually being successful in those new roles uh so so it's quite fascinating to look at so how did you get that right and was there pressure to just get some bodies in there that you had to kind of shield or were they all bought into how you wanted to um so 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 one i think you always have a bit of luck you know, it, it would be very arrogant to say, no, it was all down <laughs> to the team. Yeah, we, we, we did have a bit of luck on the way, but I think I, I'd rather be lucky than not. Um, I think we made some of our luck. Look, I think European VCs are generally more conservative than US VCs. Yep. So therefore, you don't get as much headcount. That, that There's a conservativeness that you have to be much more careful with your cash. You have to be much more strategic with how you place it. So certainly I never felt that the investors were pressing me to put more bodies in. At times, sometimes, but 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 there's no use putting bodies in if you can't train them, bring them up to speed, help them, because it doesn't matter how good your company culture is, how good other things are. If you don't train people for success, they're not going to be successful. It doesn't matter whether they've been successful elsewhere. And therefore, sometimes you're restricted by how many people you can bring in, by how many people you can actually train and make successful. Yeah. And and therefore, that's, I think, your restraining factor quite often is your ability to train and make successful, especially in a complex product environment. If you have a very simple product, then you can do it much quickly, much, much more quickly. But we have a complex I always call it like open heart surgery and therefore it's quite a complex product and it takes a long time. doesn't matter what role within the business. It takes a while for people to come up to speed and therefore you really need to help them and train them. Yeah. And our existing teams are amazing at bringing new people on board and helping them. And that's a very much a company cultural thing, but it does limit how many people you can bring in. Yeah. How much experience did you get that prior to Brightpo where you built some quite fantastic, successful sales teams? Mm-hmm. How much of that was such great learning curve and experience in a large organization that you could take and say, right, it's almost like a cutty, cooker cutter bit that you then move it into a, uh, a scale up. Would you say that was quite vital? Yeah. I, so, so people always think working in a big company if you're in a startup it is almost like a negative yeah um but what it teaches you about is building processes to scale yeah 
and and that's really the key thing is you you understand processes and, and you know sometimes the processes are very frustrating in a big company but to scale properly you have to put process in it doesn't matter because otherwise people can't always they don't understand what to do next because yeah. they don't know yeah because they're new they haven't done this before they haven't got the experience so therefore if you put processes in whether that be you know playbooks mm -hmm. whether that be compensation plans it doesn't really matter what you put it it helps to scale up so i think the experience in a large company really helps you be much more valuable in a scale up and another bit that I wanted to uh, to touch on, would you describe Brightpo as that complex sale, but in around the mid-market arena? Yeah. I speak to account executives all the time, as you can expect. Mm -hmm. That's what my uh, my job is. A large portion of these um, account executives are on a journey to large enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's where they see the, the holy grail is that I could go and sell multi-million dollar uh, platforms. Do you think that necessarily is the, the right journey? That's what people should be looking at doing? Or is there enough money to be made in that mid-market um, arena where you, where you can stay? I believe it depends on what you want to do as an individual. Some people are much more suited to one or two big sales in the enterprise a year. And some people are suited to doing 15, 20 transactions a month at the small end and then somewhere in between in the kind of mid-market three or four transactions a month. I think you've got to work out where you're strong and where you're strong is where you should play. If you can do it in the mid-market, it's a great area because you learn to qualify quickly. Yeah. You, you are, it's a great stepping stone to the enterprise if you want to go there because you learn to build relationships and rapport quickly. You, you learn to qualify quickly and you're constantly qualifying because you've got to do sales and get them through the process and get them closed on and move to the next one. So I think it's a great skill set you learn, but I think different people like doing different things. If people are doing enterprise sales as the holy grail because that's where they think they're going to earn the most money, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think you can do other things. But if they're doing it because they love the complexity uh, of trying to kind of get 20 to 30 people to make a decision on, on, on a massive thing and they love all the complexity of an enterprise, sale, then that's a completely different thing. And therefore, then it kind of suits them well. But different people, I think, have different strengths and weaknesses. And as an individual, I think you should look at what you enjoy and what you like doing rather than the holy grail of I need to earn the most money possible doing this role. Because I think as a mid-market person, I think you can earn great money. And how do you, because I think one of the, uh, in fact, I know what the, the biggest pull towards that is the basic salary. At that large enterprise, for whatever rhyme and reason you took out, the basic salary is almost considerably higher than a mm -hmm. mid-market uh, person. And so it's hard to ignore. What would you say to that when you're trying to get people to say, look, let's not look at that, um, but look at the bigger, the bigger picture around it? Well, I think sometimes it can be, okay, but how achievable is the quota in the enterprise side? Yeah. You're also betting, you know, you've got to do two big transactions a year. You can not do one of those transactions through no fault of your own. Companies getting bought, companies getting sold, yeah. and you could miss your OTE. There's, but I've seen very talented enterprise sales reps miss their numbers because two of the deals they were working on, the companies got bought, sold, there was other things involved which, which were out of their control and their sales ability. The great thing about a mid-market is you're working on multiple opportunities. So it's a nice, what I call balanced pipe. So therefore, even if you have takeovers, all those kind of things, you can still hit your target and some. Yeah, yeah. But, and I think what you've got to look at is where do you want to go with your career? You know, if you want to go into sales leadership, you may find you can get into sales leadership quicker through mid-markets. Mm. You may find you can do more deals, which means you can get further past your OTE and most companies pay more past 100%. And therefore, that difference in, in, in base salary could be negated by doing an extra 10% over target or, or, or something like that. So I don't think... It's a bit like if we go back to where we started earlier, those OTEs that you can't actually achieve. Yeah. 
that's it. So, so it, it could be that. Yeah, I, I was chatting to someone who's over at Splunk and they've been a, a large enterprise salesperson mm. uh, for nearly all their career. And he talks about it in a really interesting way. He says he manages villages because I need a village of people to get a deal done. And um, it's less of convincing a client to do something. It's bringing everybody together, making sure they're on the same page and they're all saying the same thing at the right time. And in mid-market, I think you can be more in control. Um, oh, you're definitely more in no control. Not. You're definitely, um, definitely more in control. Um, and, and, and it's, as I said earlier, it's a slightly different skill set. Yeah. It's just being able to get something done rather than having to bring everybody around and in it together. And as you're right, I've seen it with people say, right, they all want to do it. They love the product. They want it to happen, uh, but we've not got sign off for it. Or, you know, the, the, the biggest bit that I look at is what people forget is that if you're selling to a bank, it takes so long from when they say yes to you actually being able to get in and recognizing it based on all the red tape around it. If people yeah. forget all of those bits that involved. It'd be great to hear the latest part of the uh, the Bright Pole journey because obviously it's quite exciting that, that you guys have just been acquired. But what that means for Bright Pole, um, but also when people look at businesses that have been acquired, at the moment there's a lot of excitement around B and C companies, but, but why that's not just what people should be looking at and why companies that have been acquired are just as exciting as uh, earlier stage businesses. So, so for us, it's really exciting. We've just been acquired by Sage. The transaction went through about a week and a half ago. It was announced um, back in December. And it's really exciting for us. If you look at some of the areas where Brightpo was really strong from a product perspective mm -hmm. and where Sage is strong from a product perspective, our weaknesses were kind of their strengths. So therefore, yeah. the marriage is perfect for us. And we, we kind of sometimes lost on the strength of our accounting side within yeah. the Bright Pearl product. We now have great connectors because Sage invested in us over a year ago originally when, 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 we, when we did a previous round. So therefore, we've been building very strong connectors between us and the Sage Intact product. And therefore, where we didn't have that strength, we now have that strength. So I think it's super exciting for us to have that. So therefore, we can really take on some of the more bigger players in the market and really go after the market share. Um, what, why is it exciting to join? I can only speak from me personally. I've joined, I've been in um, three takeovers previously mm -hmm. and each time probably from, from, from a sales point of view sold more in those times because there's just so much opportunity in the first couple of years when there's that thing. It's much easier. A lot of the branding challenges you have as a tiny company, whether it be a Series B, Series C, the scale side where you can't do things, you have that benefit, but you're still part of a small company because we're a kind of separate entity within, within the Sage group. So you have all the benefits of being a kind of startup, mm -hmm. but, but you also have the benefits of being a bigger company as well. So, so it's a kind of great situation. And I think we'll, we're, we're in, you know, we're in early days. Nothing's perfect. Yeah. You know, and I wouldn't sit here and say the company's perfect in every way because no company is perfect. Mm -hmm. But but it's super exciting for us. Would you say from, from your side of the fence now that it becomes less pressurized? Look, there's obviously, they, they bought you because they want to do well, but it's a little bit different to a VC going, here's 20 million. I need that 20 million to turn into something to someone who goes, right, I now own you. Now let's mm -hmm. go together and, 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 and build it. And so you can actually strategize properly and not just try and nick a few quid at the end of the quarter so that, when the VCs in, the ARRs skipped up a beat. Well, well, I, I feel that the marriage here is about building for the long term. Yeah, and, and that's the great thing. Everybody's looking at it and going, "How can we service the customers better? How can we look after the customers? How can we have longevity?" Where, where you know, venture capitalists by their nature are looking and going, "How do we turn the money we've invested?" into the best possible return yeah. for the people who've invested that that is the way venture capital works you know that they're, they're they're not necessarily interested in long term they're interested in in, in return yeah and, and that's the difference and I, and I think it's an exciting difference because you're looking how do we service how do we look after 
And what you'll find is they're much more bothered about things like security, where venture capitalists will maybe not as bothered about security because they're more bothered about revenue. So yeah. you start looking yeah. at things in a very different way. And, you know, they're, they're much more interested in, you know, net promoter score and, it, and just things that, that are much better at giving customers a much better service. So I feel, and we did a great job of looking after our customers, but I feel we'll do an even better job with Sage of looking after our customers. Interesting. And, and I said I wouldn't put you on the spot um, mm -hmm. before we started this, but to put you on the spot a little bit, if you had a, a group of A's in front of you now who were really adamant they wanted their next role to be a Series B um, business, what would you say to them to say why they should consider a company that had gone uh, through that? I'd say, why do you believe you want to go to Series B? Because they always say, I want to go to a Series B because I want stock. Yeah. Most AEs don't get that much stock. No. They don't get much stock. It's not like a senior leadership role or a head of engineering or a head of, you yeah. know, chief product officer or a CMO. So you're not actually getting that much stock. And therefore, why are you going? Are you going for earnings mm -hmm. or are you going because you you, you see the excitement of, of being on that journey yeah. and if it's you know for earnings and the excitement of being on the journey you can have that somewhere else yeah yeah um and that's the whole thing and if and if they go well i'm getting this stock and the company's going to be worth 10 billion the question is how many companies get to that 10 billion yeah. you know it's not you know the old unicorn status there isn't that many unicorns even in it even in the the bull market we live in currently. Yeah, and you've got to stay there for the whole time to where it Correct. gets to. Um, also, the 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 bit that I try and sort of like really emphasise to people, even at Series B, sales is the enabler to get to the next part, but they haven't already necessarily got the playbook absolutely right. And it's like, right, if you're like, right, I want to go in, I want to maximise the return and earn as much money as I can. Go into an organisation where the playbook is done. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a learn we're always adding so nothing's ever completed but right. where you can prove say right actually you can fit in there as i say as a salesperson right we all want to work really hard but find the easiest route downhill um, right. to uh, to maximize your return and as i said most series b are not necessarily quite there so it's still a bit of fun finding out which is hence why they'll try and sweeten it with a bit of a share option um, yeah which you know people get excited about the first few times and then they realize actually um it's not quite there but actually going somewhere saying right i want to earn this much money where's the best place to actually achieve this and that is where there is an established process uh, of reps hitting the the um the number not necessarily yeah. to be. Uh, i think i think you want to go somewhere in between the two because you don't necessarily want to go to a massive corporation no. because they're it really depends on what territory you've been given. Yeah. And you're kind of waiting for a few people to leave until you get decent territory. Yeah. But if you can go to someone who's past Series B, who's worked out that their market fit, has good quality playbooks, mm -hmm. um, or has been recently acquired, something like that, then, then you have a chance of doing well there. Yeah. There's, a, you know, there's, still, there's a risk in any job, yeah. moving jobs. You know, there's no such thing as no risk. Okay, and uh, it's been great, Chastain, and I know you are uh, very busy. But before I let you go, you chose uh, to go into the the e-commerce, the the retail IT sector, and mm -hmm. I think um, COVID has brought a uh, a big light onto this this sector. Okay. I think if I uh, was told you before, fintech was the buzzword. I, I've got to get into fintech, and it was kind of overused. But now e-commerce is coming through, and and for you why why should if people aren't in that world right now for you why is it such a great place um to apply your trade look i think if you're not in it now it's it's an interesting area that's the way i look at it you know everybody understands you know they they go on the internet they look look for something and they buy it it's yeah. an interesting area yeah you know it, it's 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 really easy to understand in terms of to your own life 
yeah. because everybody goes on the internet, everybody purchases things, whether it's clothes, whatever. Yeah. It's really easy to understand. You, you meet a company and you see the challenges that they're having and you're like, oh yeah, I can understand how they're having those challenges. You know, I've had people not deliver the right thing to me. And it's, yeah. so, so it's quite an easily relatable business in general e-commerce. Yeah. And I think that's the exciting thing where sometimes, you know, security or some really complex areas it's quite hard to relate to that you can kind of understand it conceptually yeah. but it's hard to relate to your everyday life where i think this is really easy to relate to your everyday life yeah. i think you know if you can relate things to your everyday life then it becomes a little more interesting and the obvious question you think it's going to keep growing the investment is going to keep going up um, and people are going to keep trying to perfect technology in around this yeah look people are going to keep buying yeah people are People are going to keep buying online. The, the online experience is always going to look for areas of improvement. If you go back five years, people were comfortable with delivery a week later. Yeah. But Amazon pioneered the next day delivery. And now most people expect next day delivery. Mm. They expect really easy returns. You know, there's so many changes coming over time that, you know, so easy return, <laughs> excuse me, easy delivery you know, those kind of things are ever changing, you know, virtual trying, trying clothes on yeah. the, the online experience is only ever going to improve and, and it's going to change. And what we think of the norm now is going to be completely different in five years time. Yeah. I mean, even the change during COVID has actually been mm. incredible, yeah. hasn't it? And it's kind yeah. of really um, brought it forward and emphasized actually what goes on behind the scenes and how technology can, you know, uh, massively improve all of it. Nick, I, I do really appreciate you taking time out and and, um, and sharing some of your uh, knowledge and experience. And I think it's been a tremendous success at, at Brightpole for a number of, uh, of reasons, but I think they obviously chose the right uh, CRO to come in to, and, and lead it. Um, and um, actually really looking forward to, uh, to seeing how the, uh, the next challenge here at Brightpole goes um, as you move it forwards. Thanks, James. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. No worries. Take care.